Yeah, this is about an application of the low energy muon beam uh, where, where we, oops, well, let's try it this way. Okay, so it's about the uh, investigation of what you can see with the muons at the sur well, in close to the surface of a germanium wafer. And uh, it, it, this study is motivated, well, there's some motivation written here. So first of all, the controlled manipulation of charge carrier concentration in nanometer thin regions is the basis of our current semiconductor technology. And so far, I think it's not possible to see actually where these charge carriers are. You just uh, by, typically you do some macroscopic transport measurements and modeling, and from this you conclude back where these charge carriers are, where, where you have charge carrier accumulation or depletion. And with low energy muons, well, you can, if, if they are sensitive to carrier concentration, it would be nice, you can just scan your beam through the regions where you expect a change of uh, charge carrier concentrations, for example, at PN junctions. And here we used germanium as a prototype system because there the muon signals is very well understood. You have these muonium states which form and how they change with the temperature. And um, as a final goal, one would try to exp uh, apply this then also to some more technically and scientifically relevant devices like solar cell structures, oxide semiconductor interfaces, quantum wave structures, and so on. So in... in um, can, can we just that, that we can see the... Yes. Yes, a bit, a bit more down. Hold up. Yeah. So in, in semiconductors, the muons, they may capture an electron to form this hy what's hydrogen-like uh, atom, the muonium state. It's a pure quantum electrodynamic system. It has a mass of one-ninth of, of the hydrogen um, atom, so the, the muon mass is one-ninth of the proton mass. And um, so in, in the muonium state, if you apply a magnetic field, the precession signature is different to a free muon which processes at a lama frequency. Because you have hyperfine coupling and there will be transitions between uh, hyperfine states which will change the precession frequency. So we will have a, an example um, soon. And in the presence of free, ch uh, free charge carriers, what may happen is you may form uh, the neutral muonium state, but eventually it sits, the state sits, sits somewhere in the band gap of your system. And if you increase the temperature at some point, the electron is ionized, it goes into the conduction band. But if there are free electrons around, um, you will get eventually that the system changes back to the neutral state. So you will have uh, charge cycles, which will cause a fluctuating magnetic field at the muon side, because you turn on and off hyperfine fields. And this will cause some measurable depolarization of your muon ensemble. And there are two correct, well, two rates which will affect these uh, depolarization rate. There's first the ionization rate of the muonium atom, either the muonium goes to a mu plus. There could be also the muonium may capture an electron from the valence band and forms a negative muonium atom, so a muonium with, with two electrons. And this processes as the mu plus, because here you don't have any hyperfine coupling. The two spins, they are anti-parallel. So no hyperfine coupling here. So the muonium minus and the mu plus, they process at the lama frequency. And if, if there's charge capture de de defined by, uh, here it's proportional to the concentration of the charge carriers, you will drive back the, the system to the neutral state. And if there's a fluctuations, it will cause a change of the polarization over time, and this we can measure. Oops. So in, in germanium, there are actually two muonium sites. One is this uh, bond-centered site between two uh, germanium atoms. But the, the, the fraction of the muon stopping there is small, just 10 or 20 percent. The dominant fraction goes to the tetrahedral site, where it forms a muonium state with isotropic hyperfine interaction and with about 2.4 gigahertz hyperfine coupling. And we see here the bright Rabi diagram. So if you increase the magnetic field, you see here the, the, the hyperfine states. And in a uh, MUSI experiment, you, you can typically see these four transitions. And if you apply a field of about 0.1 Tesla, the, these frequencies you can see here, they are much higher than the Lama frequency of the muon. So it can be easily distinguished from, from the muons in, in, an, in, in an environment where um, you have, um, uh, where you have a pyromagnetic environment, I mean, a, a, an, an uncoupled 
Oh, or only a single electron um, with, with a muon. So in the case of, this is a simulation, what you would expect in, in this germanium states if it goes back and forth between this muonium minus in the presence of, of holes. Um, this neutral muonium state at the tetrahedral side starts to ionize at 200 Kelvin. So at 220 Kelvin, we see already a, a sizable fraction of this muonium minus state. This is the Lamor precession of the muons. And if the hole concentration is very small, like here is 10 to the 11th per cubic centimeter, which translates into this hole capture rate, this we know from some calibration measurements. Uh, then the, the way back from ionium minus to the neutral state is, is very slow and we get a very weakly damped signal. If we increase the whole carrier concentration by a factor of 10, you see a much faster damping. And in the simulation, you can easily show then uh, that the, this is the depolarization rate, so the envelope of this exponential decay here that it scales linearly with the whole concentration. Uh, this is at 220 Kelvin. If you increase the temperature, the, uh, the depolarization rate goes down because the, the rate that the muonium, the neutral muonium goes to the, to the charge state is getting faster and faster the higher you are in, in temperature. And um, this is when you do a temperature scan using uh, the muons at an energy of about 14 keV. We see here the stopping profile, so 14 keV is somewhere, um, the mean depth is 80, 90 na uh, nanometers. That these are two n-type um, uh, germanium wafers. So if you increase the temperature, low temperature, this is the amplitude of your signal processing at the Lama frequency. So the, the, if all uh, muonium is ionized, you would expect to measure such an asymmetry of 0.24. Uh, so here there is a sizable muonium uh, fraction and above 150, 200 Kelvin, there's this increase, which from th some other measurements one knows that is due to the formation of this muonium minus state. Since we have no holes here, there's no, pro uh, no reaction which drives the system back into the neutral state. Therefore, the depolarization is very small. In, in these units here, 0.02 inverse microseconds, this is a nearly undamped signal in this 10 microsecond time window. So now, um, if we check or if we compare various wafers uh, where we implant the muons with 4 MeV, so we go a few hundred micrometer deep, then we use the same wafers and just go 18 nanometer deep, we see a big difference. So these uh, solid points here, these are various wafers. Um, the black is an undoped wafer, the green is an N-type, and the blue one is a P-type with 10 to the minus with 10 to the 15th per cubic centimeter holes. So in the n-type samples, we see this increase because of the muonium minus formation above 200 Kelvin. For the p-type, we see this little increase here. This is the ionization of the bond-centered muonium state, but then it stays constant. Why does this happen? Because when the muonium minus state forms, there are so many holes around that it immediately goes back to the neutral state. So we don't see the muonium minus state appearing here because the holes drive it immediately back into the neutral state. Now we see here the open symbol. This is the same sample as here, but measuring 80 nanometer from the surface away. It looks completely different. So first we have here a much higher, what we call the diamagnetic fraction. So the fraction of muons processing at the Lama frequency, which is an indication that we have electron accumulation at the surface. And we see still this increase here due to the, due to the muonium minus formation. So there are no holes in the first 80 nanometer. So it's completely hole depleted. And there's the indication that yeah, we have electron accumulation and hole depletion from this measurement. Also, in the n-type sample here, we see a much higher diamagnetic fraction indicating maybe a 10 times higher electron concentration than what the bulk doping level is. So we then, uh, so we have electron depletion in at least 100 nanometer in this 10 to the 15 uh, per cubic centimeter doping. Then we went to a sample which had a higher doping level, 10 to the 16. And then if we go to 80 nanometer, we, we get this curve here. So we don't see this, I, uh, this, I, or this formation of muonium minus. So at a depth of 80 nanometer, now we have the holes preventing that we can see this muonium minus. But if we go to 6 keV, which is at a depth of 40 or 50 nanometer, we still can see this kind of increase. So at the depth of uh, 40 or 50 nanometers, there are still no holes. And interestingly, uh, when you go to 220 Kelvin, you il illuminate with blue light 
your asymmetry goes down, you turn off the loud, it stays here, and you, then you increase the temperature, the asymmetry comes back at around 270 Kelvin. So what happens here is that if we illuminate with blue light, we get, uh, we get photoelectrons, and it's known that at the germanium uh, surfaces, there are free acceptor states. And these electrons can fill the surface acceptor states, charging the surface negatively and pulling the holes towards the surface. And there is an energy barrier of about one electron volt for this. So it's a quite stable situation. Only if you warm up above 270 Kelvin, these electrons from the surface states go back to the bulk, recombine with the holes, and the whole repletion uh, region is, is regenerated. And if you use red light, for example, which has less energy, then the photoelectrons, they don't have enough energy to overcome this one EV barrier, and you will generate just the dynamic equilibrium of electron and holes in the surface state. So if, with red light, if you turn off the light, it will immediately jump back. So what we have, um, we see here again, this is an energy scan of the, of the sample, which was at uh, one time 10 to the 15 uh, per cubic centimeter holes and only at a depth of around uh, this 20 kV corresponds to 150 nanometers. So these are curves that you can see here which assume no holes up to 150 nanometer and then immediately the presence of holes. So we have a re relatively sharp transition from no holes to having all holes so the depletion region is sharply defined and this can be even better seen in this sample with a higher doping level. And interestingly, um, so for the higher doping level, this is about 50 nanometer depth, this curve here. And for the 10 times lower doping level, it's about, the, the width of the depletion layer is about three times larger. This is what you expect. The width of the depletion layer scales with the square root of your bulk doping um, level. So, and this is uh, actually, this you know from textbooks, how inversion depletion layers should look like. This is, I think, the first direct proof that it uh, really um, behaves like that. Now, if you illuminate um, the sample, uh, this uh, one times 10 to the 15 sample with red light, where, you, where we cannot generate this persistent change um, or persistent removal um, of the depletion layer, we see, see this maybe I just show here, discuss the, the, the experiment results. So we see here, um, temperature scans at different implantation energies. What we can see here that uh, at, at, each at each temperature, the depolarization rate increases as a function of energy. This already tells you that the, the whole carrier concentration, or let's say first the, the, the whole capture rate increases as a function of depth. So this shows you that the whole carrier concentration increases as a function of depth. And um, we did these temperature scans because the, the data can be described by this formula here, where we have the ionization rate, which is given by, by the activation energy, and the, the hole capture rate, and we can fit both together for, for all these data sets. And then at the end, what we um, get, this is the hole capture rate as a function of energy. So we see that it starts to increase from 10 to the 12th up to, uh, no, sorry, this is the hole capture rate, one megahertz up to a, f a few megahertz. This is the whole concentration that we can derive from this whole capture rate. So we start at about 10 to the 12th, up to 100 nanometer, we get this increase to a few times 10 to the 12th, and then at 150 nanometer, it should shoot up to the 10 to the 15th. So with this red light illumination, we can somehow modify this whole uh, depletion rate. We can introduce some holes, much less than the bulk doping is, and we can follow the, this whole gradient uh, with the low energy muons. There's eventually also some effect on the activation energy, the, the position or the energy that you need to get an electron from the valence band to the muonium state. This indicates there's some band banding at the surface, which we should have because we have depletion and this we have already seen before in, in other systems. Okay, so to summarize, yeah, so we, we use these low energy muons as a local magnetic probe 
um, to detect for the first time a depletion uh, a layer in these commercial p-type wafers. We can persistently remove this whole depletion by blue laser illumination. We can detect the variation of charge carrier concentrations. And now we have already some apl applications to quantum well structures where you can see the electron accumulation in these quantum well structures. And uh, more, and you, we can try to modify also these uh, depletion layers by applying electric fields and so on. And um, so the first step is done. And I'd like to thank my, my collaborators here. And thank you again for your um, for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.